All right, Al, thank you so much. It's just been over a month since NASA astronaut Scott Kelly began his year-long stay on the International Space Station. It's a mission that also involves his identical twin brother, Mark Kelly, and both brothers are with us this morning. Scott is aboard the International Space Station, and Mark's a bit closer. He's a former astronaut, NBC space analyst, is right here with us in the studio. Good morning to both of you. Good morning, Savannah. Well, I've got you here, Mark, but I'll turn my first question to Scott. You're up in space. I know you're just going over the Bahamas right now. How's your first month going? You're one month down, 11 more to go. Yeah, so far so good. Um, when I got here about, uh, I think it's been about 40 days ago, I almost felt like I had never left. Uh, it's amazing how your body uh, adapts to this environment and how it remembers actually being here. So, you know, even though there's a long road ahead of me, I'm feeling uh, pretty good about the whole thing so far. You've got five other astronauts aboard the space station with you. I'm imagining an episode of the real world. <laughs> how is it actually going up there? How are you guys getting along, and how's your work going, more importantly? Yeah, we get along great. You know, we're all professionals. We're in this together. It's, uh, you know, it's a tough environment to live in. But, uh, you know, as, as a team, we, we get through it. And uh, our work's going great doing a lot of uh, science, doing a lot of work on the space station itself. Uh, pretty soon we're going to start moving uh, one of the modules around and kind of reconfigure or reassemble the space station a little bit so we have that work ahead of, ahead of us. But, yeah, everything's great. And, Mark, you are a part of this study, and this is it's kind of a dream come true for NASA because you have two genetically identical individuals, one spending a year in space, one down here on Earth. Tell me about, I guess, the, the possibilities that this creates for NASA researchers. Well, let me, let me first back up why we're doing this. So we have a good sense of what it takes to fly in space for six months. But if one day we want to go to Mars or some other destination in the solar system, we, we know what the engineering is to do that. We don't know a lot about the human body. So Scott's spending a year in space and NASA studying both of us because we are genetically the same. That's, uh, that's going to give NASA a lot of information to reach out into the solar system. And what does that entail for you? I guess you go to Houston, you are part of experiments, they're drawing blood, all kinds of things like that? Yeah, so Scott's the guinea pig in space and I'm the <laughs> guinea pig on Earth. And there's a lot of blood draws, a lot of MRIs, ultrasounds. Some stuff, I'm not even sure what it is. I just lay there on the table. <laughs> and, and, Scott, I know you, Mark has a, a professional drawing his blood and doing that kind of thing. You have to do it yourself. I imagine it's pretty complicated to do some of these experiments up there in space. Yeah, you know, uh, sometimes we draw each other's blood, and uh, in my case, I do it myself. Uh, when I w it was suggested I do that to save crew time, I thought there was no way I'd be able to do it. But uh, for whatever reason, it doesn't hurt as much. It's easier, more convenient for me. But because of how many times I have to do this, it's more convenient for me to do it myself. So, uh, yeah, I do the blood draws myself, and I also do a lot of the other things with uh, guidance from the ground, like the, uh, the ultrasounds, for instance, whether it's my eye or heart. Uh, carotid, brachial arteries, my leg muscles, all of those are done as, as me as the operator with help from the ground. And we have some other imaging devices too that we use, especially on our eyes that, that the crew members on board are the operators, where like you said, Mark has uh, professionals helping him. really am a big follower and admirer of your Twitter feed. You're getting a lot of beautiful images from the space station, and I know you have some other creature comforts, like the new espresso machine. You know, the, the space station is actually a, uh, you know, even though it's a remote place and it's a tough environment because you can never leave, there's no running water, um, you have a lot of work to do, you're always at work. There are little things uh, that make life here more normal, like the espresso machine, which we just got running, uh, which, by the way, is a science experiment, and we only have 15 uh, espresso capsules, so we're kind of rationing those. But it worked great, tasted great. Um, recently got a uh, projector television to use for work-related things like video conferences and, uh, 
and some software we we can look at on it but we also use it to watch movies so yeah some of those little small things uh make a big difference up here Absolutely. I think they watched Gravity. I don't know if that's the movie I would have chosen, Mark. I don't know about you. It turns out, and I won't get into all the reasons scientifically, that you are now aging a little faster than your brother up in space. So when he comes back, you will be three milliseconds older. Do you have any older brother advice? Well, that's what, well I'm already six months older, so I'm going to gain another three milliseconds. And that's, uh, Einstein figured that out, right? Yeah. General uh, theory of relativity. So, um, yeah, we'll see what, see what happens with those three milliseconds. You should ask him to, like, flip over upside down so people can see he's in space. Oh, well, let's do it. I, your, your brother suggested you do some party tricks, Scott, as we, as we leave you. Can, you. can you show us some weightlessness? Yeah, he sure will, but first I need to correct my brother. He said he was six months older. He's really only six minutes older. I know sometimes he thinks he's more like six months, but it's really only six no, minutes. Six okay. Minutes. <laughs> I was wondering. <laughs> Hey, Scott, and change that Air Force sign you got in the background. You need to put a Navy <laughs> sign up there. I like this. This is a great opportunity for you to just harass your brother. I want to say thank <laughs> you to Scott Kelly aboard the International Space Station and to Mark right here on Earth. Great to see you both. Thank you thank so you. much. Thank you very much. All right. <laughs> yeah, pleasure uh, being with you guys today. Thank you. Thank you. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the NBC Today portion of the event. Please stand by for YouTube questions. Hello, I'm Hank. So you're spending an entire year in space, which is cool, but you're also very much offering up your living body for scientific experimentation here, and you are going to have significant health impacts because of this research. What makes you willing and even enthusiastic to do that? Well, all, uh, all astronauts that uh, fly in space are uh, human subjects, so it's, this is just not about me. It's, uh, you know, something we all do. Uh, certainly I'll be up here a little bit longer, um, but the reason I'm willing to do this is I think it's uh, important research that we do and it's going to be critical someday to us, uh, you know, going further out into space and hopefully to Mars someday. Hi, I'm Louis Cole. I travel the world and make videos for my YouTube channel, Fun for Louis. And in my adventures, I find there's a lot of obstacles I come across. What's been the biggest obstacle of the mission that you're on, and how did you overcome it? Well, uh, this is my uh, fourth time in space, my second long duration flight. So I kind of eased into this uh, pretty easily. It kind of felt like I had, um, really never left. It's really amazing how your body remembers the environment. Um, I think, though, the biggest obstacle or the biggest challenge will be the, the duration of, of this flight, you know, just being here for so long, never being able to leave, never being able to leave your place of work. So, you know, so far it's been a pretty seamless transition, but, I, you know, I expect as I'm here longer it'll be uh, get more challenging in that regard. Hi, Astronaut Kelly. I'm Emily Grassley from The Brain Scoop, standing in front of our meteorite collection here at the Field Museum in Chicago. My question for you. I know you're studying your immune system's responses and functionality while living in space for a year. So considering how much of a person's healthy immune system has evolved for millions of years along with life forms on Earth, do you have any predictions for how humans could maintain a well-balanced microbiome while living in space without things like plants, animals, or microbes gleaned from life forms on Earth? Thanks. You know, that's a good question. I, I do know that one of the studies I'm participating in is this microbiome research. Um, you know, we do get some, you know, fresh fruits and vegetables up here, and our diet is, uh, you know, not exactly the same it is on Earth. But uh, I really hadn't considered that, you know, what the impact uh to living here on the, the microbiome of our, our bodies is. Um, but I guess, you know, there is some, and certainly that's why we're doing the research. 
So hopefully, uh, you know, this experiment will will find those answers. I, I don't have a personal hypothesis, but I'm sure, you know, the experimenters do. And if you want more information, I'm sure your NASA contact, uh, you know, can can get that for you. Hey, Mr. Kelly, Kyle Hill here from Because Science on the Nerdist channel in Los Angeles. I'm wondering, surveying the popular culture landscape and what you know of our future space missions, what do you think will be the thing that inspires the next generation of astronauts to be the first generation of Martian astronauts? Thanks, and good luck. Well, you know, I hope uh, kids get inspiration from uh, the space program like they do other places. Uh, you know, hopefully what we're doing here inspires kids to study uh, STEM education, science, technology, engineering, math subjects, because those are critical uh, to our future, not only our space program, but to our economy as a whole. So, you know, I hope they get some inspiration from what we're doing here. I hope they also get inspiration from, you know, their friends and family and, uh, you know, people that they uh, learn from, their teachers, um, you know, whatever role models they may have, because that is our future and, you know, kids are our future. Hi, Scott. I'm Henry Reich from the YouTube channels Minute Physics and Minute Earth. I've always been fascinated by the instability of rotation around the intermediate axis of an object. For example, if you rotate around the axis of large angular inertia, it's a stable rotation. If you rotate around the uh, the very smallest axis of inertia, it is also a stable rotation. But if you try to rotate around the intermediate axis of rotation, it's unstable. You see these things flip back and forth, back and forth, and back and forth. And you can see this is obviously a challenge here on Earth because we have to throw things through the air and it's a mess. And I was wondering if you might be able to do a demo for us on the ISS. Thanks for your time and I hope you enjoy your year in space. Yeah, I guess what you're talking about is how this Leatherman tool is, ro it'll rotate along one axis and then flip over. Um, so I hope that was a good demonstration. I'll do it again here real quick as we go to the next uh, question and hope you can see this. Hello, Scott. My name is Michael Stevens from the YouTube channel Vsauce. Uh, I'm asking this question from Toronto, Ontario, and my question is about cosmic ray visuals. I've heard that up in space, stray cosmic rays can cause you to see flashes of light. Has that ever happened to you? And if so, what does it look like? You know, the first time I saw those was on my Hubble Space Telescope uh, mission in 1999. The Hubble flies a lot higher than the space station, so we can see a lot more of those cosmic rays. Uh, I would see, you know, on order of maybe like 50 an hour. Uh, but the space station is, is lower and a little bit more protected from those. Um, and you see them much less frequently, although I'll see, you know, maybe a few each night. Uh, in my previous experience with Hubble, they were very much more distinct and would kind of look like they were just white flashes of light like a firework that was kind of radial towards the center of my eye. Now they seem a little bit different, and I don't know if that's because of the altitude we're at, but a little bit more not as uh, well-defined, not uh, and, and kind of more random in, in you know, how they uh, uh, streak across my field of view, I guess I should say. But, um, you know, I was thinking about it last night when I saw one, thinking about, hey, not only is this thing going across my visual field, but it's also going through my brain. Hey, Scott, it's Destin from Smarter Every Day. Enjoyed working with you. Hope to do it again. Drop me an email if you're interested. Quick question, what kind of watch do you wear? I know you have two, but I don't know why. What features are important on an astronaut's watch? Stay safe with their commander. Hey, Destin, uh, good to hear from you. Um, so normally the watch I wear up here is an Omega watch uh, because uh, one reason the Omega is good is because it has a very loud alarm. It has a light that is very bright. It's uh, one that was designed for space. The light you can almost use as a flashlight in, if it's really dark, uh, like in the evenings. Uh, today I'm wearing a Breitling that my brother gave me because I was just talking to him on the Today Show. 
So, uh, but I normally don't wear this watch during the working day. And the other one is a sleep study watch that Misha and I have to wear the whole time we're up here, which measures acceleration. In other words, whether you're moving around or not, and light. So it can tell, you know, pretty accurately when we're asleep and when we're awake. Hey, this is Hank again. So imagine when the thrust of that last rocket stopped and you become weightless for the first time of, of the journey. It feels initially like you're falling because that's what you're doing. You're really falling around the earth and missing it for a year. It's that moment when the airplane drops in the turbulence or you're at the top of the roller coaster and you feel that feeling in your stomach. That's what I imagine it feels like. When does that feeling stop? Or does it stop? Or do you just feel like you're falling forever? Well, on, on launch, it, it stops pretty quickly. You know, um, I think some people don't even ever experience it. I don't really feel that way for long on launch after the engines uh, cut off and you first experience uh, microgravity. You know, however, you know, I can go in my crew quarters at night when it's dark and I'm getting ready to go to sleep and close my eyes and, you know, convince myself I do have a feeling of falling, but it takes a little bit of effort. But we are. We're, you know, that's why everything floats here is because, you know, it's not because we're so far away from Earth and the gravity is low. It's because we're all in free fall around the Earth at the same time. So I can convince myself that I feel that, although I don't feel it right this second as I'm talking to you. Hi, I'm Louis Cole. I travel the world filming videos for my YouTube channel. And doing what you're doing, staying up on the International Space Station, is the biggest adventure I could imagine, and I'm sure it has been for you. But if you could travel to anywhere else in space, any solar system or planet, where would it be? You know, people normally ask, you know, if you could travel to any other place in our solar system, and then I generally say Mars. But the way you pose the question, I think... If I could go anywhere, it would probably be to a planet that astronomers and scientists have de uh, determined is most like Earth. And, uh, you know, to see what's really there, you know, if there are living creatures or, or, you know, just how that planet is evolved and how similar it really is to our home planet. Station, this is Houston ACR. That concludes the event. Thank you. My pleasure. Thank you, NBC Today and YouTube followers. Station, we are now resuming operational audio communications.